listening to episode 178, where we're chatting all about metabolic diseases and your ketogenic diet, going beyond the how-to and understanding the why behind keto. And if you're looking to understand and embrace what keto can do for your body, you need to listen to this episode. We're chatting about insulin resistance and obesity, the vicious cycle, and so much more. This is another amazing takeover episode of the Keto Diet Podcast, and I'm so excited to be able to offer a platform to some of my closest holistic health pals where they can share their brilliance in an uninterrupted episode. Today we have Dr. David Harper, who's a true gem, and I'm so thrilled that he's on the show today sharing his brilliance, kind heart, and inspiring story. You are going to hear from him on understanding your why and how this is a powerful tool in changing your habits and making a difference for yourself. And he is just an adorable human, so supportive of my work, knows my book so well that he knows the page numbers better than myself, and is just an all-out, straight-up, cool human. So we're going to be chatting about a bunch of different things. If you have questions about today's content, you can head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes as well as grabbing the resources and links from today's episode by going to ketodietpodcast.com. I got two cool things with you. The first, I'm going on tour. It starts August 20th. There's still time to RSVP for both the Canadian and U.S. stops. You can go to ketodietbook.com slash tour. Sign up yourself, your friends, your mom, your dad. I don't care. Just get the RSVP in because there are a couple locations that are getting pretty, pretty high up there that we're probably going to have to close some of the registration. So if you haven't done so yet, ketodietbook.com slash tour. And there's still a bit of time to RSVP for the $100 Amazon gift card giveaway. All you got to do is take a picture of yourself with my book, Keto for Women. Use the hashtag Keto for Women. You're instantly entered to win. All you got to do is share it on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And every time you use the hashtag Keto for Women, like say you're taking a picture of the cover or some interior pages or sharing a story, just use hashtag Keto for Women and I'm donating 25 cents to up with women.org. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones and heal your body. Starting and maintaining keto can be challenging without the right support. So just for listening to the podcast, I want to give you 20% off the keto beginning with the coupon code keto podcast. That's all one word. This 30-day program gives you a clear step-by-step how-to so you can quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. Go to healthfulpursuit.com slash begin to get your keto beginning discount today. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of happyketobody.com, or maybe you know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thanks so much for listening. Hello, Leanne Vogel, and hello, listeners to the Keto Diet Podcast. Uh, my name is Dave Harper, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here on the Keto Diet Podcast. Uh, thank you, uh, Leanne, for inviting me onto your show and to speak to your audience. Uh, really exciting for me, uh, especially since um, we both have books coming out. Uh, I had a book uh, just released a few weeks ago called Bio Diet uh, that I'd like to talk to you about a little bit. And uh, I understand that you have a diet coming uh, diet book coming out uh, called Keto for Women on June 18th. Uh, very excited about that, and I, I must say that's uh, a much-needed uh, addition to the keto world is a, a, a book specifically for women um, that are interested in adopting a ketogenic diet. I also want to thank you, Leanne, for for um, for your cookbook. Uh, we use that almost every day. My wife and co-author uh, Dale Drury and I, uh, especially your uh, the bread recipe. I think I, I probably use that almost uh, weekly. I think it's on page three six six of your book. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and and um, and I, I also want to say that uh, just a thanks to you for for pointing out uh, a couple of things. One is that any kind of diet, there is no one size fits all diet, and everybody has to find a diet that works for themselves that they can uh, maintain that also maintains their health and and this involves two important things one is is to have um, is to have complete nutrition in your diet and the other 
that I think you've mentioned on many of your shows is, is the importance of mindfulness. Uh, very important to be um, aware of what we're eating, uh, what's in our food, and, and, and not just sort of respond to hunger and, and buy whatever looks like it might taste good. Now, I'm a, a, a keto researcher. I actually am um, a professor of kinesiology at the University of the Fraser Valley here in British Columbia. By the way, I'm talking to you from Vancouver, and I think, Leanne, that was your home at one time, and and I think you were from originally from Montreal, and I'm heading there tomorrow uh, as part of my book tour, so so we have a lot in common there, too. And I'm a, a, a visiting scientist at the BC Cancer Research Center, which is one of the leading cancer research centers in the world. And uh, I work in the Terry Fox lab uh, with uh, Dr. Gerald Crystal, uh, who's one of the leading um, immuno, uh, he does the immunohistochemistry of, uh, of cancer and especially the innate immune system. And uh, I think when I've listened to other people on podcasts and so on, they, they tend to begin with their own personal journey, uh, what brought them to a ketogenic diet. And and I think I'd like to start there. It was oh, about 10 years ago now, I was doing uh, a radio show. I was a co-host of a radio show called Think for Yourself. And uh, this is a show about uh, critical reasoning and about healthy skepticism. And uh, we were on for a number of years, a weekly show, and, and, and we wanted to do one show on, on weight loss and what was more effective for weight loss. Uh, is it diet or, uh, or is it exercise? And because I was a kinesiology prof and still am, I took the exercise side. And, and we had a guest, um, Dr. Richard Mathias, who is a physician and also a professor of uh, public health at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. And he took the side of, of diet. And uh, we were having a discussion about uh, what caused obesity and, and how it was best addressed. And, uh, and, and he said, well, Dave, what do, you, what do you think causes obesity? And I, and I gave what I thought was you know, the conventional wisdom at the time uh, that I believed and that I taught to my students. And that was that uh, obesity is you know, a multifactorial problem that stems from psychosocial factors and metabolic factors and genetic factors. And I talked for about 30 seconds, and Dr. Matthias was very patient with me. And uh, when I finished talking, he, he stopped me and he said, Dave, it's much simpler. It's a physiological response to excess carbohydrate in the diet. And boy, uh, you know, if I've ever had an aha moment, uh, that was it, because uh, you have to understand, I've been teaching anatomy and physiology and pathology for more than 30 years, even at that time. Uh, I'm very aware of how the human body works. And frankly, it just crystallized in my mind at that time. And I thought, wow, could it really be that simple? And uh, to... um, to go back, uh, you know, to answer the question about what's better, exercise or diet, we know now that it's really kind of an 80-20 rule, that weight loss and, and, and maintaining a healthy weight is about 80% to do with your diet and about uh, 20% to do with exercise. And we have a few sort of catchphrases we use for that. One, one is that you, you lose weight in the kitchen uh, and you get fit in the gym. And the other one that I kind of like too is that you can't outrun your fork. So, uh, so yes, diet is very important. In fact, the, um, the journal Lancet in 2017, it was a report on the global burden of chronic disease, and they concluded after their studies that, in fact, the biggest contributor, biggest lifestyle contributor to chronic disease was, in fact, diet, uh, and that diet was more important than even smoking, than alcohol, than sedentary behavior or lack of exercise, all of those combined. So that's one of the things we've learned in nutrition science uh, is that the real importance of, of diet to maintain your weight. And then what I research are the effects of, of um, ketogenic diets to prevent and even treat uh, chronic disease. And when I talk, uh, talk about chronic disease, uh, I'm talking about conditions like cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, uh, and even Alzheimer's. These are all now considered to be metabolic disorders. And so what I've done in, in, in our book, um, BioDiet, um, it's all one word, is kind of divided that book in half. And, and I've, there's some great books on, on, uh, on ketogenic diets. Leanne has some fantastic recipe and cookbooks, but also how-to books. But uh, what I thought I could lend to the discussion was um, drawing on my background as a teacher and talking about not just the how, not that just the how-to for a ketogenic diet, but I think what's really additionally important, which is why. 
So my uh, value proposition, if you like, is that if people understand why ketogenic diets are effective in weight loss and why they're effective in preventing and treating chronic disease in terms of their own body function, then I think people are going to be able to um, adopt and sustain ketogenic diets with more success. So I, I'd like to talk more about the, the why today. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the factors that I contribute to in, in terms of the how, uh, a few little nuances in terms of adopting sustaining a ketogenic diet, uh, some of which is mindfulness and, and the psychological aspect as well. So I am, uh, you know, my background is in science. I have a PhD. I'm not a physician. I want to emphasize that. If you see doctor in front of my name, it's it's because I have a PhD. Not I'm not a physician. But I've been researching nutrition science again for about 10 years. I, I kind of turned my research towards nutrition science when I realized that um, the paradigm we have um, for what constitutes a, a healthy diet, and this is the paradigm or model that's presented to us by our, our policymakers, our governments, is probably not only not the best for us in terms of our uh, health and longevity, but may in fact be contributing to a lot of the chronic disease we see today. And um, so I'm going to uh, try and explain some of that in, in the same way that, that uh, my wife Dale and I have done in our book, which is I think we, what we've tried to do is make the book as engaging and even entertaining as possible and, and to tone down uh, the depth of the science so that it's, uh, it's approachable and that anybody really can have a read of the first hundred or so pages. And if they do, they're going to have a really good understanding of, of how diet contributes to chronic disease and how adopting a ketogenic diet has the potential to reverse that um, in, in quite uh, sudden and profound ways, too. Back to today's episode in a sec. ButcherBox features 100% grass-fed and finished heritage-bred pork and organic free-range chicken. ButcherBox sends you high-quality, health-promoting meats directly to your door on dry ice and free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. ButcherBox makes committing to quality protein sources less expensive and more available to everyone. Their prices are hard to beat, and it's challenging to find a higher quality product anywhere in the USA. I've been using ButcherBox for years and love the convenience of a package showing up just when I need it, and their ground sausage is an absolute dream. ButcherBox has put together a super special deal for all listeners of the show. Order your first box and get a special gift plus an additional $20 off. Now, this special gift is so epic that I can't even mention it on the episode today. So you'll have to go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get your $20 off your very first order. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get $20 off your first order. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, back to today's episode. So I'm going to start with the model I have, and, and um, it's a bit of a takeoff on uh, George Bush, too. If you remember, he made a reference to the axis of, of evil. Well, I talk about uh, the axis of illness in, in bio diet. And, and for me, the axis of illness, if you, if you picture a, a triangle uh, with three points on it, at the top, we'd have insulin resistance, and uh, on one uh, one other corner, we'd have um, obesity, and the third axis of the triangle would be inflammation. So again, those three things, insulin resistance, obesity, and inflammation, I think are at the root cause of chronic disease. And when I talk about chronic disease, again, that's cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's, mostly what we consider to be metabolic diseases. So if you consider those three things, uh, about 70% of all chronic disease uh, is caused by or aggravated by those three things, insulin resistance, obesity, and inflammation. And I think if you talk to just about any um, physician or researcher that's uh, researching the cause or treatment of chronic disease, they would, they would agree that if we can do something about obesity, insulin resistance, and inflammation, we could really uh, address uh, chronic disease in a significant way. So that was my starting point. And um, so if you take that model, again, insulin resistance, obesity, and inflammation, they all make each other worse. It's kind of a vicious uh, cycle. So once you become insulin resistant, you tend to be more obese. And once you're more obese, you tend to become more insulin resistant. Obesity relates to inflammation, and inflammation tends to cause more obesity. Insulin resistance causes inflammation, and inflammation 
uh, aggravates insulin resistance. So they all make each other worse. So once you start heading down that road of insulin resistance, obesity and inflammation, it just kind of keeps getting worse and worse and worse until you end up uh, being di diagnosed with one of one or more of these chronic diseases. This is particularly important for women too, by the way. Um, you know, obesity for women correlates with much higher rates of cardiovascular disease and, and then uh, diabetes as well is is uh, more prominent, um, sorry, the, the Alzheimer's as a result of diabetes because you're twice as likely to have Alzheimer's if you're diabetic type 2. Um, if you're a woman, that's uh, it's even more common. So so uh, adding carbohydrate to this, which which we've been recommending for forty years, and I, and I want to say to to your uh, to your listeners, and um, also uh, I've, I've apologized in my book to my students that I taught uh, for thirty years or so. I have to apologize because I I taught the traditional food guide, which would be a high carbohydrate, uh, low fat, very low saturated fat diet. I really thought that was the best diet for health and to prevent uh, chronic disease. Since I adopted a ketogenic diet about, uh, oh, it's almost seven or eight years ago now, I've lost 27 pounds of body fat quite quickly. Um, all of my biomarkers improved quite dramatically. I, I never had needed any medication, and I was never um, you know, ill or, or, or had any uh, need of any medication or, or treatment for any chronic disease, but I was putting weight on. And, and as you put weight on, your, your blood sugar creeps up and your blood pressure creeps up. So, so I kind of uh, saw that coming and thought I had to do something. And, and, and after meeting uh, Dr. Matthias, and he sort of took me down the rabbit hole, I researched that traditional Western diet, we call it, or the standard Western diet. I looked for the evidence uh, that supported saturated fat causing cardiovascular disease and leading to obesity. And, and you know, I'm a trained scientist, and I look very hard at all the literature, and it's just not there. In fact, uh, there's no robust evidence to suggest that uh, saturated fat, for example, uh, contributes to cardiovascular disease. In fact, some saturated fats from, from dairy, for instance, are actually cardioprotective. And, you know, I think we were taken down the wrong path by a number of sort of uh, well-meaning but misguided um, scientists back in the 50s and 60s that just got uh, hooked on the on the notion that uh, saturated fat was behind cardiovascular disease, and you know because fat is more energy dense than proteins or carbohydrates, that uh, you know a high fat diet would also would also cause people to become obese and and so on. Now, when we actually look at the the science behind this, we don't, as I mentioned, we don't see that at all. At all, in fact, what we see is a central role for insulin. Now, most of you are probably aware of the fact that insulin is required. Uh, it's secreted by your pancreas, and it's required to help uh, some of our cells, especially muscle cells and liver cells, absorb glucose from the blood. Glucose is uh, blood sugar, and when you eat carbohydrates, um, those carbohydrates, whether they're simple sugars or more complex sugars, like uh, complex carbohydrates like starch, they're all converted eventually into uh, to glucose, which we call blood sugar. And when your blood sugar rises, um, your pancreas will secrete uh, increasing amounts of insulin. And uh, the insulin then is a signal to these cells to uptake the uh, glucose from the blood, to absorb it from the blood into the cells where it can be either stored or used for fuel, depending on what your energy state is at the time. Now, when, when blood sugar levels are normal and insulin levels are normal, uh, we don't have any problems that would contribute to chronic disease. However... Because since the first Dietary Guidelines for Americans was released in 1980, which suggested that we should have a high-carbohydrate diet, you know, uh, Americans did what they were told. They ate a high-carbohydrate diet. The typical standard Western diet is about 65% of calories from carbohydrate. About half of those calories are from highly processed foods, and about a quarter of those calories are from uh, sugar in one form or another. And all of that has contributed to uh, basically an epidemic increase in both overweight and obesity to the point where today 75% of adult Americans, that's 18 years or older, are now overweight or obese. It's, it's very sad. And of course, again, looking back at the axis of illness, obesity and insulin resistance and inflammation are going to lead to a lot of chronic disease. So it's no wonder. It's no wonder we've had these uh, epidemic increases in, in, in chronic disease, in particular diabetes. Um, if you look at the rate of increase of obesity, what you see in terms of diabetes is the same pattern following about 10 years later. 
In other words, it seems that on average it takes about 10 years of eating a high-carbohydrate diet as an adult before you start seeing your blood sugar creep up and your insulin resistance creep up. And then, as we mentioned, those make each other worse. So uh, right now, about half of Americans are are diabetic or pre-diabetic, and those that are pre-diabetic, about half of them will become diabetic. And um, people have suggested uh, when they crunch the numbers that by 2030, if we look at diabetes alone, by 2030, uh, it will cost uh, the United States about $800 billion a year just to treat diabetes. And to put that in perspective, $800 billion is about what the U.S. Uh, Pentagon spends uh, annually uh, this year. So that's the defense budget every year just treating diabetes. And really, as a result, I think of the chronic overconsumption of carbohydrate. So if we look at, again, look at uh, insulin, you know, you can do these experiments with mice where you give them the same amount of food over the same period of time, they eat the same amount, but you give uh, some of the mice excessive insulin, so we call that hyperinsulinemia, which means too much insulin in the blood. What happens uh, over a period of oh, about eight months is that the, uh, the mice that were given extra insulin actually become very obese, about twice the size of the other mice. Again, the same amount of food over the same period of time. So what this tells us is that um, you know, not only does insulin help us to absorb glucose from the blood, but it's also very important in, in turning that glucose into fat. So when your glucose levels are normal, you tend not to put on body fat, but when your glucose levels are high and your insulin levels, therefore, are high, you tend to put on body fat. And this has been demonstrated in humans as well. In fact, you know, you could look at the last 30 or 40 years of dietary guidelines as a massive experiment on 300 to 400 million uh, North Americans to see what would happen if we put everybody on a high-carb diet. And, uh, you know, I'd argue the results are in. Again, three-quarters of the population overweight or obese and, and half the population diabetic or pre-diabetic. That's a pretty sad set of circumstances. Now, the really great news is that we have very robust science to support this as well. If you adopt a ketogenic diet, what you're doing essentially, the simplest way to describe it, is taking as much carbohydrate out of your diet as possible. So, you know, you're taking the sugar and the starch and so on out of your diet. Well, these three factors of the axis of illness, insulin resistance, obesity, and inflammation, they resolve very quickly. In fact, we see about a 75% improvement in uh, insulin sensitivity, which is the opposite of insulin resistance, uh, within about uh, four weeks, typically, uh, after adopting a ketogenic diet. So, you know, this recent uh, really robust research done by, you know, great, uh, great researchers at the leading institutions globally, it's really changing the game now. And uh, so much so that, you know, Australia and then uh, New Zealand and now the United States diabetes societies are now recognizing low-carbon ketogenic diets as, as effective therapeutics for chronic disease. So if you look at some of the other conditions. I've talked quite a bit about diabetes. Ketogenic diets have been used for over 100 years to treat epilepsy, which is quite interesting because diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and so on, these are considered to be metabolic diseases. They're diseases of the energetic systems of the body. Epilepsy is really a neurological condition that affects the brain. And um, it's really interesting to look at. One of the questions I have is why, why ketogenic diets are so effective at treating both metabolic and neurological conditions. And uh, so there's really good evidence that ketogenic diets are effective in preventing and treating cardiovascular disease. This would be heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure for epilepsy, as I mentioned, and for diabetes, as I mentioned, and also weight loss. Um, I think it's pretty conclusive now that the best way to lose body fat and keep it off is to sustain a, a ketogenic diet. There's also really interesting emerging evidence to support the therapeutic use of ketogenic diets for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the leading cause of infertility in women. Very important because uh, it seems like uh, PCOS, as it's called, is actually a disease of insulin resistance. So again, if uh, the high-carb diet is causing insulin resistance, well, um, that can lead to uh, a PCOS. It can also lead to acne and even um, cancer. Back to today's episode in a sec. So I've been doing a little something for 10 minutes a day and all of you are starting to notice and you're like, what is your secret, Leanne? Your skin is glowing. What are you doing? 
So a couple of months ago, I was quite hesitant, but I ordered a Juve Red Light Go. It's a handheld device that I hold up to my face for 10 minutes a day. It's red light that stimulates collagen, counteracts the signs of aging, is beneficial on the effects of wrinkles, acne scars, hypotrophic scars, and the healing of burns. And it's also been known to be an effective natural acne treatment. And as a 30-something-year-old whose mother told her that she would definitely stop having acne at 18, I can tell you that's a straight-up lie because I am now in my mid-30s and still struggle with acne. But for the last couple of months since I've started using my Juvgo every morning for 10 minutes, my acne has gone away. My scars from way, way back in the day are healing. And my skin has this wonderful, beautiful glow. So if you're wondering, what is this thing? How do I do it? It's a handheld device that emits red light. I put it close to my face every morning for 10 minutes. It's a rechargeable light. It lasts about 10 days on one charge. So you just hold it up. 10 minutes, relax. When it turns off, you go about your day. You can find out more by going to juve.com slash keto. That's J-O-O-V-V.com slash keto. Click on shop and choose targeted devices. Now, if you want the device that I have, it's the Juve Go Red model, and that'll help boost the collagen in your face, reduce the fine lines, acne scarring, and all that amazingness. Help boost your glow. Again, that's J-O-O-V-V dot com slash keto. Okay, back to today's episode. So I'll talk a little bit about um, cancer now. Uh, this is my area of research. And uh, I'm part of a, um, I guess, an international group because some of us are here in Vancouver. Uh, the rest are, are uh, the, most of the study is being done. Uh, Jeff Volick's lab, Jeff is at uh, the Ohio State University, and we've teamed up, uh, we at the BC Cancer Research Center have teamed up with Jeff uh, for a three-year study to look at the therapeutic benefits of, of ketogenic diets for women with metastatic breast cancer. And, uh, and before I go on, I just want to say that, uh, you know, my, I grew up, um, my mother was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer when I was just a boy, five years old, and, and she struggled with that until she died uh, just before I turned 10 years old. So it's something very close to my heart. So to be able to contribute to something that might help women with breast cancer is, is, is very rewarding for me. So I guess what the simple model for how ketogenic diets might help with cancer is that um, cancer cells, for the most part, don't have the same metabolic flexibility as other body cells. And when I say that, what I mean is other body cells can use different types of fuel for their energy needs. They can use uh, proteins, uh, fats, and, and uh, carbohydrates, glucose. However, cancer cells, um, it's this, um, this shift in metabolism. Cancer cells are driven towards cell division. That's why they grow uncontrollably. And there's a, an effect called the Warburg effect, or Vorburg effect, which is that cancer cells will, because they can't use fats and proteins very well for fuel, they're dependent on glucose, so they'll concentrate glucose 100 to 200 times that of normal cells. Now think about that. Your cancer cells are there growing, and they're dependent on carbohydrate, on glucose, almost exclusively for their energy needs, and so they're concentrating at high rates. So, so on a high-carbohydrate diet, you're really supplying all of the fuel that these cancer cells need to grow. And what's more is that uh, because your blood sugar levels are high on a high-carbohydrate diet, and as we've discussed, your insulin levels are also chronically high on a high-carbohydrate diet, insulin is also a growth factor. It's a very powerful growth factor. So it stimulates cell growth and division. And if you fold that into the mix, here we have these cancer cells in an optimal environment for growth. They have all of the glucose they need and more, and they have these growth factors, which are kind of like fertilizer. So the basic principle behind which a ketogenic diet works, without getting too sciencey on you, is that we're removing excess carbohydrate and, and we're limiting the amount of insulin. And, and what that does is kind of tip the balance in favor of your immune system. So your immune system will have a better chance at identifying destroying those cancer cells, which is one of the important roles of your immune system. So even when we are treated with various um, therapies, uh, ultimately it's our immune system that has to win the day. And one of the things that we've discovered in a very small sample, they're not controlled studies, but just 
preliminary pilot studies have indicated that one of the effects of a ketogenic diet is a heightened immune response. So we're seeing a more effective immune system in people that are keto-adapted than those that aren't. And that may also help to tip that balance in favor of your immune system winning the day. So it's really hard to prove that a ketogenic diet would prevent uh, something like cancer because you'd have to have these massive controlled studies for decades with thousands of people and it would just be cost prohibitive. So what we have to show is, uh, as best we can, is that um, the mechanisms by which ketogenic diets work have some anti, anti-cancer anti properties to them and, and, and maybe immune enhancing properties. So early days still, I, they were only in the middle of this three-year study, so we don't have any final results, but I would say that the um, preliminary results are very promising. I would also add that uh, ketogenic diets are not a replacement for your standard of care. You should always take the advice of your physician, your oncologist, if you have cancer. But you should discuss the possibility of, of using a ketogenic diet as an adjunct therapy, so along with the standard of care, whatever that might be. That's our hope. And and hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have some more conclusive results. There, there are some other studies that are working on something called GBM, glioblastoma multiform, uh, and even pancreatic cancer. All of those have some promise, uh, but still early days, and we can't make any uh, any broad conclusions. The other interesting thing about ketogenic diets in terms of a therapeutic is they may be beneficial for preventing and treating uh, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's has been considered um, by uh, Suzanne de la, de la Monte at uh, Brown University. She calls it type 3 diabetes. Essentially, it's insulin resistance of the brain. So the brain doesn't need insulin to get glucose in, but it does need insulin internally within those nerve cells to have the nerves working properly. So I kind of like to think this, I use sort of a car analogy. Some cells, the insulin is a key to get you, uh, to unlock the door to get you inside. In the brain cells, you can get in okay, but you still need that key to turn the motor over to get the fuel running properly to the engine. When I was in school back, you know, last century, we always learned that the brain could only ever use glucose as a fuel, and there's still some myth out there about, you know, you need 150 grams of of carbohydrate every day because that's what your brain needs. Well, your liver can make that just fine, and I, I know Leanne's talked about that on some of her other shows through a process called gluconeogenesis, or making new glucose from non-glucose sources. So this would be your glycerol, uh, lactic acid, and, and in particular proteins. So we can make our own. And when we burn fat on a ketogenic diet, we produce these ketones, the most important of which is beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHB. And this is actually a preferred fuel for the brain. The brain will take the... It doesn't need to draw the, um, the uh, fuel in as it does with glucose. It actually has to expend energy to get the glucose in the cells. The glucose simply uh, works down its concentration gradient and enters the brain cells passively. And when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's metabolized within those brain cells, much less oxidative stress on those brain cells, which is beneficial, and also much less inflammation. Alzheimer's disease is, no question, an inflammatory disease of the brain, and ketogenic diets are particularly anti-inflammatory, and we know now that, that, that they have uh, positive effects on the brain. And some work uh, by my friend and colleague, Stephen Kunain at uh, the University of Sherbrooke has shown that exogenous ketones, so let's say MCT oil, which I know um, Leanne's discussed on previous shows, the medium chain triglyceride oil, especially the C8 version, is uh, converted completely. You, you take it, exogenously means you take it, you, you eat it, uh, so it's in the form of a liquid oil or a powder. And those ketones, those the, that MCT oil is converted 100% of its C8 into into uh, ketones within the liver, and then that can circulate, and it's a really powerful signaling molecule. Um, and and as I said, the brain preferentially uses it at lower cost. So it's kind of like it's kind of like shifting your brain from like a gas-powered brain to an electric brain. So you're taking all that that fuel out of there that has all kinds of uh, wastes and, 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 and um, hazardous sort of waste and, you know, carbon and so on that it's producing as a, as a, in the exhaust, and you're switching it to a cleaner burning, more like an electric car, a cleaner burning fuel. And what uh, Dr. Kunain has found uh, was just reported in the media a week or so ago is really profound improvements in the cognitive function of 
Alzheimer's disease patients who are taking just 30 grams a day of MCT oil, that's two tablespoons a day of MCT oil, really profoundly improved uh, brain function, cognitive function. And we also expect that those on a ketogenic diet have some protection from, from Alzheimer's disease down the road. I hope you're totally digging this episode. I love putting these together every week and I hope you're getting something out of it. I love seeing where you're listening from. So next time you're listening or even right now, take a picture of yourself watching the show or a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag me on Instagram at Healthful Pursuit. And if social isn't your thing, that's totally fine. Just jump on your favorite podcast player and leave a review for the show. Okay, back to the good stuff. So there's just a couple of uh, chronic diseases um, that we're kind of looking at. I've counseled hundreds of people over the years on ketogenic diets, and, and I thought I'd just quickly um, talk about, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the questions that tend to pop up. Can you be on a ketogenic diet if you're a vegetarian, for example? Yes, you can. It's actually quite easy as a vegetarian. You can even do it as a vegan. It's a little trickier there. Will I get sufficient uh, nutrition on a ketogenic diet? Absolutely. A well-formulated ketogenic diet, which the bio diet is a well-formulated ketogenic diet, these provide, in fact, more nutrition than the standard Western diet because you're taking out all those empty calories that are sugar and starch and you're replacing them with healthy fats and, uh, and other nutrient-dense other nutrient foods. Is it sustainable? Ketogenic diets are absolutely sustainable. My wife and I have been on a ketogenic diet for more than seven years. Uh, I know people that are more than 10 years. Um, there is a period of transition where you, need, you have a metabolic change where you need some help from a nutritional counselor. Uh, but once you've adapted, I call it bioadapted, to a ketogenic diet, you'll find that those cravings for sugar and things like bread and rice, they just go away because you have this really satisfying thing that you're adding to your diet, which is called fat. And fat, healthy fats, whether they're saturated or not, are really, really satisfying. That's where all the flavor is in food. So, so you kind of replace the need for sugars and sweet things with, with more of an interest in savory things. So those are just a couple of questions that come up a, a lot. So I'll just talk, uh, to finish up, I'll just talk a little bit about our, our book, uh, Bio Diet. And if you're interested in having a look at the, the book, our website is biodiet.org. And uh, both Dale and I have our emails there. It's dale at uh, biodiet.org or david at biodiet.org. So if you happen to pick up the book, uh, we'd love to hear what you think of it. So what we've done there in the how-to is to break the conversion um, from uh, sugar burning to fat burning into five five steps. And the first step, and you know what, this is this is very, very much like what, what Leanne's done as well. Uh, Leanne really knows what she's talking about here. She's got a lot of experience as well. And uh, so what, what I suggest, first of all, is, is talk to your physician, especially if you have a chronic disease, especially if you're taking medication. It's very important, especially during this adaptation phase, uh, because you might need what we call concomitant reduction of of the medications that you're taking for high blood pressure or high blood sugar, and only your only your physician can determine what's appropriate for you. So start by talking to your physician. Then you can talk about the sorts of measurements that you can take, both physical measurements and measurements of the lipids in your blood and blood pressure and so on. I call this uh, this step bioassessment. And then what I've added to um, to help people avoid the keto flu, which I'm sure many of the listeners uh, know about or have experienced, is is I, I um, have a, a next stage is called biopreparation. And what I what I ask people to do is to ease into a ketogenic uh, diet to uh, bioadaptation by first reducing sugar, increasing your water intake, uh, adding MCT oil, which introduces your body to these ketones that it's probably not that familiar with. Uh, slowly over a period of a week or two, uh, before you go sort of hardcore, cut the carbs down around uh, 20 milligrams a day, which is which is required for most people to bioadapt. In other words, to, to change from sugar burning to fat burning. And I like to think of this kind of like if you've ever if you've ever learned to play guitar, you know um, that uh, over a period of a few weeks when you're practicing guitar, you'll get these calluses on your on your fingertips. 
And those calluses are, are protein, keratin that's building up. It's the cells are responding to the stimulus uh, by changing, and they get thickened uh, calluses. Well, the same kind of thing happens when you when you bioadapt. That is, you're probably your body's probably not that familiar with the, the ketones or fat burning, and it takes it a little while to activate the genes and activate the proteins that become the enzymes in those metabolic pathways that allow you to burn fats instead of sugars. And, and during that process, there's going to be some unfamiliar things going on in your body. And so you'll sense some changes. And uh, some people call this, you know, the dizziness and the sort of nausea and sleep and brain fog and so on. They call it the keto flu. And I, I experienced this myself um, because I went cold turkey uh, when I uh, bioadapted. But you can avoid that uh, with a couple of easy steps. One, I think, is to introduce it slowly. The second is to make sure that you have uh, the salts right, for example. Salts being sodium, potassium, calcium, and especially magnesium. All of this is, is discussed in, in BioDiet. And that will eventually take you to a place of constant nutritional ketosis. In other words, you're constantly fat burning and uh, you're producing these beneficial ketones, especially BHB, uh, which your brain loves and your heart loves and even your muscles love. And that actually, it turns out, has a rejuvenating effect. So I call the step after the adaptation phase biorejuvenation because in terms of your biomarkers, not your chronological age, but your physiological age, you actually get younger. Uh, the inflammation is reduced, and, and, and we even have a term called inflammaging. Inflammation really contributes to the aging process. So by preventing that, that uh, inflammation, you're actually slowing or even reversing to some degree the aging process. When I see reversing, there is actually some, uh, we call it epigenetic evidence, that there's changes in, in telomere length and so on. These are little, little kind of like the plastic things at your end of your laces that are at the end of chromosomes, and they tend to shorten. As you age, uh, it turns out that the uh, BHB has the effect of actually reversing uh, some of that. These are very preliminary studies, of course. But your skin improves. You lose body fat. People say you look great. You feel great. The brain fog goes away. And sometimes this change is very, very sudden. My, my, my friends like to call it the, uh, the Harper High, where they'll just wake up one day during this adaptation phase and just feel fantastic. And I can tell you from my own personal experience counseling people that some people lose more weight than others. Uh, some people respond better than others. Ketogenic diets are not for everybody. So it's important that you there are some, there are some conditions for which you shouldn't be on a ketogenic diet. But for those that can benefit, and, and my rough estimate is that's about seven out of eight people can benefit after the 12-week intervention, which is the sort of minimum amount of time you need to really make those changes in your body, but also in your, in your head so that, you, so that you, you have new habits that are very positive and, you, and you've reinforced the importance of, of uh, sustaining the ketogenic diet. A hundred percent of the people I've counseled after the 12 weeks say they feel great. No matter what happens, they feel great. And, and, you know, what's wrong with that? Nothing, of course, right? It's, it's, um, it's a fantastic way to end. So, I, again, I really wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Leanne for the opportunity to talk about, uh, about our book, BioDiet. I'm going out on tour in Canada, and then I'll be doing a lot of podcasts and radio uh, in the United States over the next uh, few months and years. Uh, I'll be at a few conferences and giving local presentations. Um, I also want to, as, as a fellow author, really congratulate Leanne on her new book, which is uh, the, um, the uh, Keto for Women book, which comes out June 18th. I think I think this, this uh, is being recorded uh, a couple weeks before that. Um, but having written a book, it's, it's a real uh, challenge to write a book, you, to finding the time to do it and taking the care to make sure it's good. And, and judging by, um, by Leanne's previous books, uh, I just know this one's going to be uh, super popular and, and very, very important for, for women that are on the ketogenic journey. So thanks again. Uh, you can find more information and even read part of the book on our website, uh, biodiet.org. And please have a look for the book. It's available on, on all your usual uh, online book retailers as well as in stores uh, now. And, and if you do pick up a copy, please, please get in touch with, uh, with us through the website and let us know what you think. And uh, to wish you goodbye, I, I wish you all health and happiness, and I hope to see as many of you in person in the future as I can. Thank you very much.
Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.